Hello everybody, how's it going? So welcome to another One Piece review. This time we're covering manga chapter 1120. I can honestly say chapter 1120 will go down as arguably one of the best chapters of 2024. For me personally, it's definitely in the top five. Easy. We had a lot go down in this chapter, also titled Atlas R.I.P. But even though we had a two week wait for this chapter, there was no shortage of One Piece information that we got. Courtesy of the One Piece live action information that we got about season two, plus the SBS information that we got throughout this two week period. So, so I'll quickly go through that before I dive into this chapter. I'll start with the live action because we got we do get cast members for certain characters that are going to be a part of season two. But right now, at least from what I've seen, apparently Mister Three, Miss Valentine, Mister Five, Mister Nine. We got the cast that's going to be voice acting Dory and Bragi. So the Giants are involved. They're going to be voicing Crocus as well. I'm not too sure about that, but they're in the list as well. Smoker Tashigi. We got Warpole and we've also got Dalton. Now, those characters alone should confirm that Season 2 takes us from Logtown to Drum Island. See the cast list for the characters that are going to be a part of Season 2. Automatically, I guess you to think about... Uh, key characters that are noticeably absent from this cast list. Four of them in particular. So, and I have my own two cents of why I think this is being kept in the dark. First off, there was actually a kind of like a panic within the community because because the previous chapter was 13 pages, which is usually short for a One Piece chapter. So a lot of people are concerned about Oda's health. It's no secret that Oda does have health issues, but he did recently say he's in good spirits, he's in good health right now. So that's good if that's the case. So, But I was kind of thinking this may have something to do with the announcement that production has begun for season two. So the timing can make the timing would make sense if Oda is like giving hints to the production staff on how to produce season two. He may not, I don't know if he's going out in person like he did for season one, but he may be giving pointers over the phone. And I could definitely see because Oda has previously mentioned, it's established that Oda gets off in introducing new characters and he loves producing silhouettes. That's a, th that's a kink that Oda has. We know this. We should, I wouldn't be surprised if Oda gave a hint to the production staff, say, hey, you're free to introduce this, this, and this character. You're free to reveal this cast list, but keep these characters out. Now, the trailer, when we get that for season two, may be a different story, but that's not going to matter too much. If they're being kept away from the cast list, which we know the, these four characters, and by this you can kind of like predict who I'm talking about. The whole point of One Piece live action is to get new eyes on One Piece. That's Oda's aim here. So if you don't think Oda's going to give a hint to the production staff, hey, keep these characters out the loop because it's okay if you want to include them in the trailer, but they're not going to know who they are until the series season drops. And there's no and considering everybody has access to the leaks online and field in the cast list online on the internet, if you don't leak these characters in the cast list, they're not going to know who these characters are. So. I, I definitely feel that's what's going on here, which is why we haven't got any information about certain characters that should be involved. Like I just mentioned, Logtown through Drum Island. I absolutely would not be shot. So going from the season two live action info that we get, we go to the SBS, which a lot of people are going crazy about. I'm going to go from the least surprising and the least interesting information to the most interesting and the most intriguing piece of information that we got. So the SBS that we got on the volume of 109 for One Piece and we find out that Fujitora's sword is one of the 12 supreme great blades which shouldn't be a shock at this point which I don't know what role Fujitora is going to have going forward like he may have a tangle with he may clash with either Zoro later on which I don't know if Zoro's going to have too much of a problem with considering he's a lot stronger since the last time they clashed or he may clash Fujitora may clash with Mihawk which I don't know if that's going to go well for him either then we go from that and then we get information about Cypherpole, in this case, Khalifa and her lineage with Alpha, who we couldn't find out. And this was not shocking by any stretch of the imagination. Like she looked exactly like Khalifa. So it's revealed she's the young Alpha, the same lady 
representing Cypherpol, who not only blackmailed Kuma, is like, hey, we're holding your daughter hostage, so you better follow through. She was also ripping up Bonnie's letters that were meant for Kuma, which Bonnie ended up taking down by the end. But we find out that Alpha is the younger sister of Khalifa. Now, we knew, I kind of figured there had to be some connection that they were related, but I didn't know she was the younger sister. So that's kind of interesting. But we do also find out the father is Lasky, which I don't know if that what relevance that has unless he's a member of the Holy Knights. So that could explain why even after C Khalifa, a part of CP9, failed to capture Robin after Eni's lobby, they got ended up getting promoted, all of them, to CP0. And they failed again to because they let Vivi get away, thanks to Wapple. So I don't know what's going to happen to them there, but that could explain why they weren't why they weren't dropped or killed because they failed to get Robin, which is crucial to the world government. It's least interesting information or the least shocking information that we get to the most interesting information that we get. So also find out that four years ago, Ace defeated a warlord who Kuma ended up taking his place after he was defeated. So he goes by the name of Hanafunda, who's the king of lizards. So, but Ace was able to defeat him and then Kuma stepped in to take his place as a Shibukai. Is Oda kind of like introducing or hinting at the possibility of getting introduced to another kingdom here? One of the ancient kingdoms that was that was sunken into the ocean? I don't know. Because otherwise, why reveal that? Why reveal the nickname the King of Lizards? So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense unless Oda's alluded to something in the future. Maybe. Obviously, I'm going to talk about the last piece of information. And this is what... This is what got a lot of people talking and still talking to now the lineage of the empress of the kuja tribe in the amazon lily so gloriosa obviously was an empress following her was shaku yaku aka shaki she was also on point in telling rayleigh that boa hancock may end up falling in love with luffy and that's what ended up happening then we get the predecessor of boa hancock tree toma and I, one thing I will say when it comes to like Oda, and Oda when it comes to like the designs of the empresses of Amazon Lily, at least in their prime, is on point with every one of them. So that's kind of cool. So Tritoma, she has black hair with a mole and obviously the same earrings that the previous empresses I'm sure wear. And but obviously Boa Hancock, the snake empress of Amazon Lily, who... Again, there has to be a reason why Oda is revealing this. It's because, in my opinion, Boa Hancock has a huge role to play, not only in assisting Luffy, but or maybe heading into the final arc. Maybe. So, the last time we saw Boa Hancock, it was after she got attacked by Blackbeard. Rayleigh stepped in to save the day. After this, Boa Hancock said she was going to leave because to avoid putting people in danger. She also said she wants to marry Luffy. So, there's definitely going to be a reunion again. My idea was this, like, Boa Hancock could run into Cross Guild, considering two of those members helped out Luffy during Marineford. Number two, we also have Mihawk, who Boa Hancock know, is more than familiar with, so I wouldn't be surprised if she tagged along. Now, we don't know if she's traveling solo on a ship, or members of the Kuja Pirates tag along with her. We don't know. But I could definitely see that playing a role. And by the way, if that's the case and, the, and Margaret ends up surviving, definitely see her being the empress of the Kuja tribe in Amazon Lily by the end of the series. Easy. Just like how people seem to think Kobe will be Fleet Admiral by the end of the series. It could be, but I get the feeling that Oda, knowing that he doesn't like people kind of guessing correctly what what's going to, going to go on, especially with the ending of the series. So he may throw a curveball here. And maybe if Kobe isn't Fleet Admiral, I wouldn't be surprised if he's Admiral. And the position of Fleet Admiral goes to goes to Tsushigi because it has to go to a member of the new gen, go to someone who's against the ideals of Akainu. So it's either Kobe becomes Fleet Admiral or, or it goes to Tsushigi. Those are the only two that come to mind. I would say Smoker as well, but we saw him a couple of chaps. We saw him recently traveling going somewhere we don't know where he's ended up but the fact he's not with Tashigi right now is telling so i don't know what's going to happen with him the lineage of the empresses of amazon lily so that was kind of cool we got that information like i said i kind of feel like and this is pointing towards boa hancock being hyped up for something 
coming very soon. We go to this chapter and we go to the cover page and immediately the kids are throwing stones at Yamato in the last cover page. They get netted up by Denjiro. So that's not so they're not gonna be nuisance to her anymore. So Yamato can continue on, on a journey again. This is gonna to lead to by the end. We start the chapter off 26 years ago in Punk Hazard. Now so we see Vega Punk. We also see a dragon and one of the numbers peering over the entrance of Punk Hazard, the same entrance that Zoro cut down, by the way. So they're confronted by Professor Clover, and we get a lot more information about him than ever before. Professor Clover asking Vegapunk to assist him in his research of the Void Century. And Vegapunk's like, no, can't do that. I'm tied to the world government. But then this is where Clover reveals, number one, my brother was killed right in front of me because he had the name of D in his name. Then we get the reveal. My real name is Claymo D. Clover. So he's a D. So I'll get to that by the end. But because there's something else that may, this may be leading to. But Lang, but Lang saved himself when he got his brother killed. Because, so Stella is like, okay, I'll ignore what you said. But you should just give up on this research. So, so four years go by, 22 years ago, Vegapunk and Caesar get the get the news the O'Hara incident happened and obviously Clover being killed which is kind of important because we know Vegapunk ends up going to the remnants of O'Hara to pay his respects so this kind of makes sense you got Caesar in the background so oh they finally got that archaeologist so Vegapunk go pay his respects at what used to be O'Hara and we know where this is leading because this is where he has the body poster of Nico Robin. All about this, we know in this scene as well, he ends up meeting Dragon for the first time, a young dragon. You also see Vegapunk in this scene tearing up. So now it's also important to note Oda highlights the books that are underwater. And this is the second time Oda has alluded to this in this arc. It's funny because Vegapunk is like, oh, you chose death. Did you expect somebody else to follow in your footsteps? And yet here we have Vegapunk doing the exact same thing that Professor Clover tried to do. And we know Vegapunk ends up following in his footsteps. But we also know in this scene when he goes to O'Hara or what's left of it. And while he was tearing up over the passing of Clover because they were friends. Dragon was exceedingly pissed about this act by the world government. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Also the books that, get, that Oda just happened to highlight. In a panel underwater, the, the same box that were recovered by giants from Elbaf, by the way. So then Vegapunk says in the present, someone once told me the voices of the past call out to you. Which is funny because that's literally what happens with Luffy in this chapter. It is interesting, we go around the world we see and we see as Baratier, the unblood related father of Sanji, Zeph. It looks like we also go to Tequila Wolf because obviously the prisons in the background are they're wearing the same prison gear that Robin was wearing. Speaking of Robin, we actually get to see Robin. And this is not only did we see her in this chapter, but she's awake. And the last time we saw Robin was after the attack of Saturn where she used Spider-Net to catch Nami's group, the rest of Nami's group. So after that, we haven't seen Robin. The message of Vegapunk was playing throughout the attack of Saturn. So... But it's interesting what Robin picked up from this information that's clear with the Dendamushi clearly right next to her and she's tearing up. So that was very telling, especially in the same scene where the words of the vanquished are usually cast into a deep, dark ocean. That being said, the truth can still come to light if the oppressed carry it on their backs and endure. I'm not going to repeat the same thing. I mentioned this twice already about what Robin's role is going to be on Elbaf, but it's very convenient. You have that dialogue and Robin just in the background, listening in, tearing up. So there we go outside to where the Sunny and they haven't, and Nami and Zora's group are having problems because Nashjoro is still in range. So Lilf is saying Nashjoro interferes with their trajectory of landing. They won't make it. So they need to do something about this. Nashjoro is about to attack again. But then this is where Atlas comes in. It, it seems confusing at first, but you really have to pay attention here. So, so Atlas comes in to attack Lilf, but the reason is, is because she's, she's taking out the transmission that York is following to make it seem that Lilf has been dealt with. So that's why that scene comes confusing to the Straw Hats. So Lilf is like decked by Atlas, but, and then this is where Atlas is like, I'll leave her in your hands. Take off and make sure you make it in one piece. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, and this is where 
York totally falls for it because she's like, oh, Lil's access has been severed, so Atlas is the only one left. So she's on the, the assumption by the end of this chapter, she's the only remaining surviving Vegapunk, which is not the case at all. But we know how, how much of a hothead Lilf is anyway, so this might be actually to her benefit. So then Atlas comes charging in to Nash Joro. I love how you have Zoro, Zoro yelling, we'd regret it if we hesitated now. Do it, Brook. So he's fire, firing up the collar for a coup day burst and it's an epic scene. Meanwhile, while Atlas is charged at Nash Joro, she loses an arm. Atlas is forcing Nash Joro further away from the Sunny. Uh, even if it is by a little, it's allowing them to escape. So that's really epic on the part of Atlas. We go to where the Iron Giant meets up with Luffy. And then this is, this is really funny because you have like the Iron Giant call out to Joy Boy. I'm happy we got to meet again. Not knowing who Joy Boy is, Luffy turns around thinking he's talking to somebody else. And this is happening while Ema is extending his hand to Luffy. And it's like he's flat out ignoring him. That was hilarious. But then this is where Ebert says to Luffy, your enemy is my enemy. I can fight for you again, Joy Boy. And then this is where Luffy actually finds out that, oh, you can talk. But, he's, but at this point, you have Jupiter and Top Man staring down the Iron Giant. The Giants from Elbath, they talk to Luffy about, hey, is he a French draw hat? And Luffy's like, not really, but he did say something about protecting some guy named Joy Boy. And this is the first instance I'm guessing Luffy's heard about Joy Boy. Now the Giants respond, it taught, we didn't hear a thing. We got Vice Admiral Bluegrass ordering the cannons to fire at the, at the ship, which connects, so that's a problem because they said they did, if the ship gets damaged, they're not going to be able to escape. Speaking of damage, you have Jupiter coming in, taking a chunk out of the right arm of Ema. So Atlas wasn't the only one that lost an arm in this chapter. So yeah. Jupiter is trying to attack him with one arm. He manages to block it block his attack with the other arm so shout out to emit for that oh, but while emit is blocking jupiter it comes saturn out of nowhere go heading for the ship latches onto the giants from elbath ship and that becomes a problem because he's standing in front of not only luffy and the giants but also bonnie and kuma which he literally notices but i'm like okay whatever we know how this is ending anyway so and then this is where sanji notices the sunny coming down i don't know if he notices Atlas as well because he's immediately following that the sunny is falling down they're going at a fast speed Nash Joro is saying oh you mean to sacrifice yourself and Atlas just smiles like no I'm just lending a hand literally she lent a hand it follows up with an explosion so so RIP to Atlas a real one going out like a boss so landing in direct line of sight with the giant ship which Luffy's on Bonnie's on, Sanji and Frankie are on, along with Kuma. I'll get to that in a second. Also in the explosion, it looks like Nash Joro also got caught in it because if you see him again, he's like, he's like regenerating. So that's actually really dope. But as they're landing, you got Vegapunk narrating 25 years ago, Gold D. Roger achieved the unprecedented by circumnavigating the globe. They must have heard voices from the past. You got Top Man and Jupiter charging for Ema. And then Vegapunk goes on to say, I'm confident you have all come to the same conclusion that I have, that I anticipate is what will ultimately determine how things transpire in the future. Again, I'll get to that in a second because there's a section of that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you add context from the previous chapter. But we see a few prisoners and talking about, oh, Goldie Roger. What do you say? Goldie Roger? So that's how the chapter ends. With, again, another cliffhanger involved with Vegapunk. But like I said, you have the Ema having two elders charging at him, Jupiter and Top Man. You have Saturn latched onto the ship belonging to the Giants right now. York is under the impression that she's the only surviving Vegapunk. And after this chapter, she's not going to be. Like, Love is tagging along with the Straw Hats as well as Barney. I'll start off with that because Saturn is obviously threatening to attack Kuma and Barney again. The thing is that you have Luffy there, you have Sanji there. So if you don't think they're going to intercept the attack or whatever Saturn is planning to do, the Sunny right now is falling right in the same position as the ship from Elbath. We have Sanji who could literally use Skywalk to get Bonnie out of there. You also have Frankie that could get Kuma out of there and get to the ship. There is another possibility, and I mentioned this a while back when Kuma first arrived. Like, we knew he was going to show up, but we didn't know what his role was going to be. He may have the energy to, like, get Bonnie away, either on the Sunny, or he may use it on the Sunny himself. 
I mean, we're going to have more than one person sacrificing themselves, it looks like. Like, so shout out to Atlas for the love is tagging along. So I have Akuma goes with the straw as I'm Barney to Elbeth. I was thinking about what Frankie could do from here on in because maybe he can inherit the will of Vegapunk to bring Kuma his humanity back. Maybe. But now you have love for the picture and maybe they can both team up because that's the dream of Frankie. He is, he would be teaming up with Vegapunk. It just happens to be Lilf who was full of greed which her personality would blend in well with Nami's just saying. And it also makes sense from a narrative standpoint because Lilf was the very first Vegapunk the Straw Hats got introduced to and so did we. So that would make the most sense why she's the only one tagging along. Do see Kaku who Kaku literally said to Stussy, get out of here. We don't know what Stussy's going to do, who she's going to end up with. We don't know what's going to happen with the Xerophon. They may have a role to play. I've been saying that as well. Kuma may sacrifice himself as well if he uses his ability to warp. The because at this point, it's, I hate to say it, he's like cyborg vegetable. Like he has, he has no awareness of what's in front of him. Like he's just reacting on an impulse, but that's not enough. You also have Vegapunk, his final words to Luffy were, keep Barney safe. Oh, that's not going to go to the wayside. So it's going to be either Kuma sacrifices himself or it's going to be Frankie and Lil's duty to find a way to re recover his humanity. I'm just throwing it out there because there has to be a role for Frankie to play and there has to be a reason why Lilf is tagging along at this point. So like I said, you're thinking she's going to be the only surviving Vegapunk. Not going to play itself out. We may get a confrontation between her and Lilf by the end. We don't know whether or not what's going to happen to those that are on Egghead Island. Like, for all we know, Emu could pull the plug and actually launch another attack. Vegapunk has a prediction for the future. Now, I did go on to say, like, the words that he says, the way the pres prisoners are asking about this, their curiosity, is obviously that we, what we want to know. The thing you have to remember is, when the transmission restarted in the previous chapter, I said this... Uh, he was talking about the Will of D, but, but a section of that transmission got cut off from us and the rest of the One Piece world. We didn't get to see or hear what he was about to say about the Will of D and those who had the name of D in their name. So we could have get the we could have the giants sacrifice themselves. I've been saying that Dorian Bragi at the very most get in the sunny away. If Kuma doesn't do it, then the giants will. But there's going to be somebody else that throws their life on the line to get the strats away. I. I Atlas sacrifice is not going to sit well with Luffy considering how he acted when Luchi punched her face in and how Luffy reacted after that. And my other point about this, we got the reveal of Professor Clover being a D. Is this Oda setting us up for another member of the Straw Hats potentially having a D in their name? Because listen, obviously it ain't Sanji. We don't know about Zoro, but outside of them, there's only one other member with a full name. I'm just throwing it out there. Because Oda, we thought we knew everything there was to know about Law. Then Dressrosa came along and we found out Law was a D. He wants to know about the will of D as well. And he said that to Nico Robin. By the way, the second instance is last year, we found out that Queen Lily of Alabaster was Nefertari D. Lily. And we also found out VV was Nefertari D. VV last year. I kind of want to know about the brother and what connection he had to Nick Olivier and Nickel Robin. There has to be some kind of relevance to that, why he name dropped, why he kind of mentioned that his brother was a D as well there, because any, at this point, as far as the final saga and Oda is concerned, anything is possible. We know what, I've talked about this enough, about what Robin's role is going to be on Elbath, along with reuniting with Saul. We know that's coming. This chapter was solid. It's, like I said, one, definitely one of the best chapters of the year. But if I, if I have a nitpick about this chapter, it's the whole stuff about Goldie Roger and the fact that this revelation by Vegapunk, about Goldie Roger, hearing the mysteries of the world, hearing about the Will of D, hearing about the Void Century, and he's trying to come make it come across, come as a shock to the Straw Hats and us. We know, we know that they found out the secrets of the world. We know they've learned about the will of D. We know they learned about the Void Century. I don't know how many times I've brought this up about the scene at Sabri Archipelago. Oda made a reference to one of the chapters ending it with Rayleigh talking about, hey, Vagapod, don't be a dick and don't ruin this adventure. It's their time, isn't it, Roger? That's literally a reference to what he was telling Straw, what he told the Straw Hats and specifically Robin 
don't be in a hurry because you might come to find out something different than we did. What significance does that serve as far as the straw hats are concerned? That's not a shock. The only tidbit of information that we got is he used the voice of all things, which is not a shock because we know he had it. We know Luffy is using it. it. I mean, he's talking to Ema, a direct robot connected to the past involving Joy Boy with the voice of all things. So outside of that, this chapter was great. It was solid. Atlas going out like a real one. Lilf could be joining the gang along with Barney. I told about, I've talked about my reasons to why Barney's coming along. It makes the most sense. It, especially if the Gorosei survived this. We don't really know what's going to happen with the Gorosei. Things are made more unpredictable. Even though Mars was sent flying, that doesn't necessarily mean he's out of the picture. So for all we know, the Elders could survive and they could still play a role. And that would give, because Saturn is the thorn in the life of Kuma, Ginny and Barney. So... If they survive, that's a conflict of interest for Barney. And because she's already teased using an appearance similar to Luffy in Gear 5th, I don't know why she wouldn't refine that and make it even stronger to deal with the Gorosei. So that's where this is leading. Plus, we know there's a celestial dragon that kidnapped Ginny that wasn't named, but it was mentioned for a reason. Again, Barney's still in the appearance of a child, so maybe Kuma could do something to actually get her to the sunny. Either that or Sanji's going to use Skywalk. This chapter was solid. Definitely one of the best chapters of the entire year. For sure. For me personally, I don't know how you guys feel. But let me know in the comments below. That's going to do it. Thank you guys for so much for watching. Like the review if you did a thumbs up. I appreciate that. I appreciate all you guys support when it comes to my One Piece reviews. Catch you guys later. Thanks guys. Bye.